Tonight, church, uh, you're in for a treat here at midweek. Uh, it's, it's a very, very special night. Um, you know, it, it hasn't been, uh, you know, uh, the easiest year for us as a church because of everything that we've gone through. But along the journey, God always brings special key people. And I think they are divine encounters. And I think they are God moments. And a few months ago, uh, Pastor Head, our Spanish pastor, was in Colombia. And while he was in Colombia uh, at a church that we love over there, and he was there because they were in, uh, celebrating a brand new uh, auditorium that they just, uh, you know, opened up that fits over 600 people. I mean, what the church is doing is amazing. Uh, he was over there celebrating it, and he got the opportunity to meet this pastor that you're going to hear from tonight. And uh, in speaking to this pastor, this pastor says, hey, I want to I speak to you guys. He's here locally. He came, and uh, me and Pastor Head, I met, met him up a few months later for lunch. A couple, about a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, we met him up for lunch. And it was one of the most beneficial, life-giving, God-speaking lunches I've ever had. Not only was the food good, that's not what I'm saying, and not because of the food, but the wisdom that he spoke into our life. I mean, I, it was literally from heaven. And uh, to be able to hear from a man of God that is a seasoned in ministry, that has been through so much, that God has used incredibly, not only here in Miami, he's also the global pastor of Ecclesia around the world. Uh, to be able to ha spend time with this man of God and hear from him uh, was an honor and a privilege for us. And it has given us uh, so much benefit, so much wisdom on how to deal in this new season that we are walking. And I thank God for his life. And uh, me and Hedda afterwards said, we, we need him to come preach at church. He is not only, I think, a local legend, he's a global legend around the world. Um, he's senior pastor of Ecclesia Central. Him and his wife, Jessica, are incredible. And I believe that tonight, um, we're going to walk out of here different than how we came in. I believe God has a word for us. I believe he hears from God, and I believe he's a man with authority from God, with a, God's hand over his life. I want you to lean in. I want you to take notes. I want you to shout him down, Calvary style, the way that we do. I want you to preach. If you got a hanky, you know you can wave that hanky. You know you can get up and run around, uh, but I believe that it's going to be uh, God speaking through him tonight. So church, can you please help me welcome Pastor Jose Victor Dugan tonight. Come on, can you get up on your feet and welcome him? Come on. Wow. Wow. You breathe something special in this place. First of all, I want to excuse myself for my English. It's, you know, a little bit limited. <laughs> and I haven't preached in English in a couple of years. And in Miami, you know, you practice English so much. <laughs> it's, and I just want to say hello from my wife. She's picking my mom at the airport. And I said, you know, I wanted to bring her, but I don't want to leave my mom at the airport. <laughs> so she will come next time with me. Uh, I'm from Barranquilla, Colombia. Any Colombians here? Yeah. And uh, just, you know, one of those interesting facts. Your pastor's wife met Jesus with me. see some friends and uh, I give you permission to correct any word that I say wrong okay you know the problem is that in Spanish I have like a pool of words many words and those that know me there's some people here that know me I speak fast I think fast but in English I only have like a bathtub of words <laughs> so people think I know English it's really that I really know how to mix the same 50 words, you know, all around. Them. <laughs> but it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be able to serve your pastor, your team. And uh, I was telling them that it's incredible when you find purpose in pain. And uh, my wife and I, we've gone through so many things in ministry and to be able to use the pain that we've gone through to help others is an honor so thank you for having me here pastor alex i love you very much and yet and you know your families so i'm gonna go fast uh, i want you to go with me to i think it's haggai that's how you say it. haggai haggai 2.9, it's a verse that is, you know, 
Many churches use this verse and all the churches want this verse to be for them. <laughs> and Haggai 2.9 from the NASB says, The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. How many of you believe that? Uh, how many of you believe that? It's really a promise for Calvary for this church here. I want you to know something. I've been preaching for over 25 years. You don't know how many messages I have. But I pray to God for Him to give me the word from the Spirit for you tonight. You see, I didn't say, I'm going to look for a verse that matches what they're going through. So this is a word from God to you. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, in this place, where it seems there was a lot of turmoil, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So, you know, this word glory, the word glory, you know, it comes from different words, kabod, doxa. But basically, glory is the way God makes himself known. It's the way he presents himself. You see, when, God's, when God wants to show off, he shows his glory. You see, glory is more than his presence. The presence of God is everywhere. I think it's uh, Jeremiah 23, 24, where God says that he fills the earth and the heaven. You know, and the heavens. There's no place that you, are, that you can be where God is not. You cannot go to a place where God isn't there already. So, so sometimes, you know, when we're praising and worshiping and we say, let's go into God's presence... It really is not like that. You, know, you see, he's always there. In fact, you carry his presence. But it's not the same thing, the presence to the glory. The glory is the manifestation of his presence. And God wants a glorious church. Because you see, you can be in God's presence and nothing happens. But it's impossible that you're exposed to his glory and nothing happens. You see, a broken marriage can be in his presence for years and it still can be broken. But a broken marriage can be in his glory for one second and be healed forever. You see, you can be an addict in his presence for years. But when you're exposed to his glory, the addiction has to live. So God wants to raise a glorious church. And the Lord gave me this word for this church, for Calvary, not for Ecclesia Central, for this church. You see, the Lord told me the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former glory. And something I've learned with pain is that when you're in the middle of the crisis, usually you don't know what is happening. And I remember uh, uh, something my wife and I, we were at the Louvre Museum in Paris. And I love art. My mom is an artist. So I, she's taught me to, to appreciate art. So I was in front of this huge, uh, ¿cómo se dice? Olio. Oil, an oil painting, oil, right? And, but huge, I mean huge. It, w it was from here to that wall. And twice the height of this auditorium so I got very close to the painting very close like this and I saw a black stroke and it was like rough it wasn't even it didn't even look professional it was like a stroke that a little kid could do black stroke didn't have any meaning I was so close that I didn't know what it was so I you know stepped back a little bit and I noticed the stroke was the belt of a soldier and then I stepped back a little bit more. And that soldier was part of a huge army. And then when I went back like 30 feet, that I could see the whole work of art, it was a huge battle with thousands of soldiers. But I just didn't know and couldn't know what it was when I was too close. You see, I know it has not been an easy year. Don't try to define what has happened. You can't. You just have to trust that God is in control. And, and every month that goes by, every year, you're going to go back and you're going to you know, grow farther away from what happened and you're going to see that all the time, what, something that seemed black without purpose, 
it always was a stroke of a master artist and was part of a beautiful work of art that the Lord is doing in this place. So don't try to define God's work by a stroke. The latter glory of this house is going to be greater than the former glory. How many of you believe that? I want to know. So, you see, so the glory, glory is the way God presents himself. When he wants to show off, you know, glory is like his business card. Glory, there it is. <laughs> it is the evidence of his presence. And God wants his church to be a manifestation of his glory. But you know what? I, I wrote it in English because I don't want to make a mistake. You know, I put here, there's never been more evangelistic campaigns, manifestations of God's power, salvations, TV programs, social networks. Never in the history of humankind, church has been doing so many things. And never church has been as ineffective as it is nowadays. There's never been the, the healing campaigns that we have now. Never as much as now. Thousands of people are being healed every day. But the cities have lost their morality. Never we've had so much um, suicide rate. The suicide rate, you know, has gone through the roof. The youth is, I mean, I believe the youth today are the most intelligent people that have stepped on this earth you know, that's what I believe. But right now they're without guidance. And the church has not been very effective. Establishing God's purposes on earth. So I ask myself, so how much more do we have to do? We have churches where you feed 150,000 people. We have... Never had so many TV channels that are Christian or Christian or Christian churches in channels that are not Christian. Sunday, Saturday, every day of the week, all the time you put a TV and there's going to be somebody preaching. So I ask myself, how come if we're doing so much, so little is happening? You see, the 21st, I'm going to be 50 years old. Although I look 30, I know. I could see your, your face like, oh, I, know, I, know, I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know, that's the most impacting thing I've said tonight, I know. And my wife and I, we've gone through so much these last 10 years that I want to be sure I'm investing my life the right way. I don't want to waste my time. So what is the problem? The problem is, thank you guys. The piano player also left. <laughs> yes, I know. When I have 10 minutes left. Les conviene que me avisen. Okay. No, si hablo en español, me sale el turbo. Ahí sí van a ver todo. Okay. <laughs> I feel so strange speaking like so paused. I think my pastor, my pastor is as gringo as you can be. He will, I think he will be so proud of me tonight. <laughs> like, wow, Jose, you've matured. You're pausing yourself. <laughs> I'm just trying not to say something horrible. Okay. <laughs> so what is the problem? I believe the problem is that we've been walking in the, in the past glory, the former glory. When we, when Haggai 2.9 speaks about a greater glory or a latter glory, this word greater does not mean more of the same. You see, the church thinks that the latter glory that is greater is the same glory, just that in more quantity. So I'm going to give you an example from my life. When I married my wife, she only knew how to cook tuna. <laughs> Every day. Tuna salad, tuna empanada, tuna soup, rice with tuna. When she got creative, tuna with rice. Soup with tuna, tuna in the soup, 
So after six months of being married, I was like this. So imagine, you can imagine, I couldn't see tuna. So imagine one day my wife tells me, calls me to my office, honey, tonight I'm going to make you, you know, a meal that is greater. I'm like, wow. And she tells me, the latter food, the latter meal is going to be greater than the food. And I come home, and what she has is tuna, but a lot. I mean, the whole gamut, you know, tuna salad, tuna soup, tuna empanada, tuna That's what the church has been doing. The church has been trying to copy what has happened in the past, but in more quantity. You see, so we think that the latter glory is more miracles. Because we think that glory, which it is, of course, means the atmosphere of glory like we had here when we were worshiping. It's an atmosphere of glory. And yes, glory has to do with miracles. Glory has to do with healings. Glory has to do with, you know, restoration, with the supernatural. So the church begins to project herself. Instead of projecting to the future, begins to project herself to the past and say, okay, let's do Azusa, but greater. Okay, let's do the Toronto Revival, but greater. Let's do Brownsville, but greater. So we want more tuna. <laughs> more miracles. More healings. More glory atmosphere. More power. But when Haggai was speaking about a greater glory, he was not speaking about more of the same. Because the, great, the word greater there means that it exceeds. It means superior. It's not more of the same. He's referring to a different glory. A glory that exceeds the former glory. Not that it's more of the same. It's no more tuna. So even though the church is in a sense, you know, a church that functions in glory, in atmospheres of glory, and have, we have this beautiful worship. And nowadays, churches, you know, you can now go to worship seminars, worship conferences. And so churches are learning how to create an atmosphere of glory where God can do mighty things, even though never before we have had so much of this glorious atmosphere. The church is not advancing. We're not winning the cities. You see, the church is not the kingdom. The church is the embassy of the kingdom. And I'm going to say a joke, but only people in Spanish are going to know what it means. <laughs> la iglesia es la embajada. El problema es que la iglesia está embajada. <laughs> ¿Lo entendieron? You see, you English-speaking people, you better start learning some Spanish. <laughs> I want to tell you something because, listen, listen. French is the language of love. German is the language of war. You see? English is the language of business. And Spanish is the language of heaven. You better start learning some... No, no, no. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I love English. And I love the USA. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so listen to this. So... The thing is that the embassy, we've, we've become so uh, efficient in growing the embassy and so inefficient in advancing the kingdom. That's why the embassy, every, every day that goes by, embassies are growing larger. But the kingdom is anemic. There are cities in the world where every block in the city has a church, but no church has its block. But we, you know, we, we sometimes we're satisfied by this. That's why I love the series your pastor just gave about loving Miami. So this former glory, you see, is different than the latter glory. And so I'm going to try to, 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 to teach you both the difference. And you're going to see why the Lord gave me this message for you. Those that know how I preach, they know that I introduce very long and I preach very short. <laughs> so now I'm going to begin preaching. Okay, so repeat after me, the former glory. The former glory. So the Bible, in the Bible you can see that former glory. One of the, the places where you see that former glory is in Mount Sinai. When Moses 
told the Lord, I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord said, no, there's no way you can see my glory and live. So Moses had to hide himself behind a wall, like a crease. That's how he said it, like in a rock. And he, the Bible says that Moses only saw God's back. You see, this glory, this former glory has one characteristic. It's, say after me, external. You see, it's a glory that came outside of Moses and influenced Moses. And the Bible says that Moses' face became so radiant, so brilliant, that people couldn't even look at him. And Moses had to put a veil so people wouldn't feel, you know, like, I don't know how you say that in English. In Espanol, se encandilaban, right? You know, it was so bright, they just couldn't, couldn't take it. You see, one problem with this glory that is external, it comes from the outside and it affects you. And the church loves that glory. I mean, I love this. But sometimes the church is addicted to this. You know why? Because that glory doesn't change you. It just affects you. So the problem is that you want more of it. Because the Bible says that in his presence there's fullness of joy. So some people that only know that glory, they would like to be here every day. That's why some churches have service every day. Because they only have that glory. So people are not really being changed. They're just being affected by something that comes from the outside. But there's a problem with that. That Moses had to put a veil and people couldn't look at him. So that glory is a glory that doesn't allow us to relate to people. Because sometimes the church is, you know, submerged, immersed in this glory so, you know, for so long, for so many days, that when we go out, we cannot relate to people. We forget what people really feel. We forget what people really are going through. And we forget how the Lord finds us. So if the church only... Knows that glory, which is God's glory. It's a beautiful glory, but that's the former glory. It's not that the glory is bad. It's just that that glory is not the one that is going to allow the church to fulfill the purposes of God for this season. So it's a glory that is not relational. Because sometimes we're so bright, so brilliant, that people look at us like, some people are so religious that you don't know if they're a Christian or they're a ghost. <laughs> they fly. They don't walk. They levitate. You know? And they come into the room. Here it comes, you know. Whoa. And, they, and people go like, whoa. And, and some pastors are like that too. So even the church cannot relate to him like, no, no, no. Until he falls. So there's another place where you see this glory. In the transfiguration. Peter, John, Jacob. Jesus transfigurates himself like. Whew. It's an external glory. And Peter was so impacted by this glory. What did he say? Let's stay here. You see that glory can make us selfish people. Peter. You know he didn't care for the other nine disciples. He didn't care for the people in the world. He said, this is so good. And I mean, I feel like the prophetic song. It feels good. Do you remember that song? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a prophetic song. So sometimes the church, you know, it feels so good that we forget about the lost. So the church has become disconnected because if you only have that glory, that glory disconnects you from reality. And we become selfish. So the church has become so religious, so brilliant, so selfish. That that's why even though we see the glory every time we meet. We are doing nothing for our community. But we love this. I mean, I love this. But this cannot be it. So what is the latter glory? I'll tell you the next time you invite me. No, no, I'm telling you. Okay. (laughs) 
John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. I'm going to try to explain something in English that is not easy. Not even in Spanish. You know this word, word, in the original is the word logos. It means spoken word. The sound that comes out from the mouth. So this verse that usually we use it to explain Jesus' divinity, which of course we all believe, I don't think the main purpose of that verse is to explain that. Because it says, the word was God. So that means he isn't anymore. So I don't think that verse is really, I mean, believe me, I know Jesus is God. I just don't think that is exactly what this verse was meant to be, you know, put there for the, by the Spirit. I think that this verse is talking about when God created the earth. Not the beginning, no, the beginning of this earth, when Adam and Eve sinned. Listen to this. Jesus is God, he's eternal, he's been always, you know, the Trinity, we believe that. But when Adam and Eve sinned and God came and rebuked Adam, he rebuked Eve, and then he rebuked the serpent, which is the devil. I don't know how, how it says in English, but, the, but, but God says, because of what you've done, I'm going to put, you know, like uh, enemistad, enemistad, and between, between your uh, simiente, seed, between your seed and the seed of the woman. But he wasn't speaking about Eve. You know, the woman, Israel. And what is the seed God was speaking about? He was speaking about Christ. And he's telling the devil, you're going to hurt that seed in the heel, you know, here. Because it, you're not going to be able to kill him. Even though you're going to hurt him. But he's going to hurt you in, your, in, in the head. He's going to kill you. That's what happened in the cross, right? So listen to this. So I believe when God announced that, in that moment, Jesus, the eternal God, was announced as a word with regards to his plan of coming here to this earth. Because it had not happened already. He was just a logos that had come out of God's word. Of God's, you, you understand? So what happened? In John 1.14 it says, And the word became flesh. So it came a moment when that word that was just a word became a reality. What God had announced before, one day, it, you know, Jesus, I mean, God becoming man, stopped being just a promise or a prophetic word or a logos. And, you know, in the right time, it became a reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the word became flesh, became real. And he says, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, his glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Listen to this. There has to come a time when every Logos you've heard stops being a Logos and becomes flesh in you. There has to come a time when every preaching that you hear, every time you read the Word, every song that you hear, stops being just a Logos, a Word that comes out from God's mouth and has to become real flesh in you. It means that it has to be translated into real attitudes and actions in your life. And the Bible says that when the Logos becomes flesh, we see His glory. The latter glory is not miracles. It's not healings. It's the Word when it becomes flesh. It's the Christ is the character of Christ, is the attributes of Christ, is when Christ becomes real in you and people can see him, it's the only way, it does the only glory that can dwell amongst the people. There's no other way Christ, his glory, can dwell with people unless he becomes flesh in you. And there's a saying in Spanish. I'm going to say it in Spanish and then I'm going to translate this saying into English. They say, puro tilín, tilín y nada de paleta. <laughs> in English would be, a lot of ding dong and no ice cream. 
I'm not tell you what that means because this example is perfect for this teaching. You know where that you know where that saying comes from? Barranquilla. In you no know, many years ago, the guys would sell, and still today they have a little car and they had ice cream inside, paletas. So they would go and they had a little bell. And these people were trained to ring the bell all the time, you know, sound the bell. Tiling tiling, say after me, tiling tiling. You can, you can sell paletas now, okay? <laughs> tiling, 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 say tiling, tiling. <laughs> you see? And you know why they had that bell? Because during, you know, in those times, kids would play on, in, on the street. Not like now, like, <laughs> uh, let's, let's play soccer. Okay, let's go. <laughs> no, they were playing in Barranquilla. It's called bola de trapo. It's like a rag ball. It only lasted for two games and you had to buy another one. <laughs> so they're playing and suddenly they heard. <laughs> yes. So what, what did that mean? Ice cream, paleta, paleta. So you know what they would do? Immediately they would run inside the house to go to look for mom, to look for. Oh, yes. So this guy would ring the bell like, you know, he was ringing the bell all the time. But you were here like two blocks away. Tiling, 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 tiling. <gasps> The ice cream man, the ice cream man. Let's go, mommy, mommy. Las paletas, mommy. Okay, here go. So then they would go and stand on the street like this, you know, in, in, in the sidewalk like. So the, here comes a guy. So you would stop him. You would stop him and you would say, hey, dame una de coco. Coconut. But you know what happened? Listen, that these guys had trained themselves so much to ring that bell that even after they had sold everything, and they were going back home with the car. They had to walk. They were going. <laughs> so little kids would come. Hey, you know, hey, paleta, paleta. Yes. Eh, fresa ahí, strawberry. No tengo. Se acabaron. Vainilla. No tengo. No more. Coconut. No tengo. <laughs> si son de Barranquilla. Corozo. No tengo. That's a strange fruit. <laughs> and then you would ask him, okay, so what do you have? No, I don't have anything left. <laughs> so if I say this the way we would say it then, I would never be invited again. Then you would say something, I mean, the elegant way was, okay, if you don't have any ice cream left, what the beep? <laughs> Are you ringing the bell? <laughs> Because the bell is supposed to announce that you're bringing ice cream. You see, the church with the latter, with the former glory, is being, has been ringing the bell for years. Tiling, tiling, we save marriages. Tiling, tiling, God saves, God loves. But when people get close to the church, there's no ice cream. It's just a bell ringing, an atmosphere. That's why they don't believe us anymore. You know how we answer to them that there's no ice cream? When they get close to us. And they see our marriages. Especially the marriage of the pastor. Or when they see how you treat your wife. Or how you treat your husband. With disrespect. Or you're working with them. And they see. When you do the exact same traqueteos that they do. Jose. They call you. Tell him I'm not here. You see the truth is. That we're ringing the bell. And we have this beautiful atmosphere. And people cry. And they see miracles. But when they, close, they get close to us. And we open the ice cream cart. There's nothing there. In fact. There's something totally different. Than what they feel here. You see. That's the former glory. What the world needs is the latter glory that is greater. The life of Jesus Christ manifested in us, through us, in our daily lives, in work, in college, in the university, at school. Come on! Yes, let's stand up. 
So I want to tell you something. One last thing. That is, this is very hard what I'm going to tell you in the last two minutes. The problem with the former glory. Excuse me. This is the hardest thing. Is that it allows us to live a double life. That's why you see great men of God. God using them, I mean, powerfully. And in the moment of greater glory, I mean, but of former glory. Suddenly things happen that you say, how could that happen? Because the external glory can still go on. Even though if there's corruption in the heart. Because th that external glory can happen because of you. Because the Bible says that God inhabits in the praises of his people, not of his pastor. So when the church worships, when the church worships with the heart and all that, the glory is there. The former glory, you know, and it's beautiful. God wants that glory too. But that's not the glory that is going to fulfill his purposes. So what happens is that the leaders will learn professionally how to handle and manipulate that glory. We know how to produce that external glory and people see miracles and see everything and people still believe Christians wrongly believe that when a pastor or a little leader is in sin, God is not going to use him. That's a lie. The greatest men and women of God, they fallen in the moment of more glory because we're judging incorrectly. How did that happen? God's mercy manifests His glory. He wants to heal people. He wants to heal. Yes, He wants to. But that's here, contained here, in this atmosphere. And what are you going to do at work where you don't have this incredible band? I need to, I need to show His glory. Hey guys, can you please come with me to work tomorrow? Okay? And then you're, you're on your desk and they're behind like, This is a song. Yes, please, please worship with me. This is... God loves you. Oh yes, he loves. No, 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 no. You carry his glory. You carry his glory. Come on. So let's learn how to enjoy this. But let's understand that if we want to win this city, we need the latter glory. Learn how to take every message, every logos, every word, and translate it into actions and real attitudes that people can see that Jesus lives in you and through you. Thank you, Father. Come on. Thank you very much. God bless you guys. Church, can we put our hands together one more time for Pastor Jose Victor Dugan? My goodness, I didn't want him to stop teaching. Thank you so much for that word. That is what we've been trying to say for the past uh, six weeks of I Love Miami. This is great, but it's on us to carry it out to our city. It's, it's not on a pastor, it's on a church together to live this out every day of our lives. Oh, come on, with every eye closed, every head bowed, we can't let this opportunity go by. We never like to gather together without giving people a chance and an opportunity to meet Jesus. Tonight, if you walked in here for the first time, for the second time, or maybe you've been coming for a while, but you do not know Jesus, I think tonight is the perfect opportunity for you. If you don't have a relationship with God, I think tonight is the perfect opportunity to start a relationship with Him. All across this auditorium, or if you're watching online, or if you're listening on the radio, If you're here and you're saying, Alex, I, I don't know God. I feel far from God. I have sin in my life and I'm messing up. I've been following my own choices, my own decisions. I, I feel like I've ruined my life and God wants nothing to do with me. I'm here to let you know he wants everything to do with you. He loves you so much. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. It is no coincidence that you're listening to this tonight. God loves you. He is in love with you. God is not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. All across this auditorium, while the church is praying, eyes closed, head bowed, the Bible says that sin separates us from God. And all of us have sinned. Nobody's perfect here. Sin has separated us from God, but God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to come die for you and for me. The Bible says that he took your sin, my sin, all of our flaws, all of our mistakes, all of our guilt, all of our shame. 
all of our sin. He carried it and he died on a cross. The Bible says he gave his life on that cross. He went into the grave for three days. But after three days, Jesus resurrected. He's alive today. He's the only way to the Father. He's giving life. He's giving you a brand new opportunity. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to forgive you, heal you, give you a brand new start, a brand new beginning. And tonight is your night. The Bible says tomorrow's promise for no man. Today is the day of salvation. If you're in here tonight and you have no idea where you would go tomorrow, if you were to pass away, if you were to die and go into eternity, if you have no idea where you would spend eternity, tonight you can walk out of here knowing you have a relationship with the God who loves you. While the church is praying, eyes closed, head bowed. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I believe hands are going to go up all over this place. And if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. If you're saying, I want, a, I want a brand new start. I want forgiveness of sins. I want a relationship with God. You raise your hand. We're not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to single you out. Just going to acknowledge you, and then you can put it right back down. Come on, the church praying. If that's you, raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand across this auditorium. Amazing, amazing, awesome, awesome. I see you. God bless 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 you and you. And you, God bless you. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else, you raise your hand. If you're watching online or listening on the radio, you can make this decision as well. All I'm going to do is say a simple, simple prayer. And you can talk to God any place, anywhere. I'm just making this first one easy. All we're doing is asking him to come into our life, forgive us of our sin, putting our faith and our trust in Jesus. In fact, the whole church, I want all of us to repeat this out loud. But if you raise your hand, say this strong. I believe God is listening. And he's about to come into your life and give you a brand new start. Say, repeat, repeat this with me out loud. Say, Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this opportunity. I admit that I'm a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. Jesus, I believe you're the son of God, that you died for my sins. And on the third day, you resurrected. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. From today on, I am saved. I am forgiven. I'm a Christian, and I'll follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, church. Oh, come on. Can we put our hands together? Come on. Can we celebrate?